When many African countries were gaining independence in the mid-20th century, Southern Africa was an outlier. Here, colonial powers and European settler interests held on with a tight grip, resisting the broader wave of decolonization. This region's late arrival to independence needs to be understood through its unique colonial roots and the factors that made decolonization particularly difficult. Many African countries gained independence in the late 1950s and early 1960s, but Southern Africa wasn't among them. The key difference here was the presence of substantial European settler communities, in addition to the typical colonial administration. These settlers weren't merely transient colonial bureaucrats. They were landowners, farmers, and business people who put down roots and built communities. European colonization in Southern Africa began in the late 19th century with Britain, Portugal, and Germany among the major players. The region stood out due to its valuable mineral resources, fertile lands, and strategic locations. While other parts of Africa were mainly exploited for resource extraction, Southern Africa saw the rise of European settlers who intended to stay for good. This settler presence became a formidable obstacle to decolonization. Most of these settlers, predominantly of British and Dutch descent, had a vested interest in maintaining colonial rule. They controlled significant portions of the economy, especially in industries like mining and agriculture, which thrived after the discovery of diamonds and gold. This economic power made them even more resistant to the idea of independence. Socially, settler communities created exclusive networks of schools, churches, and institutions that excluded or marginalized the indigenous African population. This resulted in a rigid social hierarchy where settlers held most of the privileges. Politically, they used their influence to pass laws that cemented their dominance, such as strict land ownership rules, labor regulations, and voting restrictions that kept the native population in a subordinate position. South Africa's apartheid system became the most extreme manifestation of the settler resistance to decolonization. When the National Party came to power in 1948, they formalized racial segregation into a comprehensive legal framework, separating every aspect of life based on race. These factors, the deep-rooted settler control, the social hierarchies, and the strict political legislation, created a tough barrier for independence movements in Southern Africa. The settler-dominated societies in Southern Africa were some of the toughest nuts to crack when it came to decolonization. As the rest of the continent was moving towards independence, these areas became hotspots for regional conflicts and Cold War intrigue. Here's how these factors played into the late arrival of freedom in the region. Independence in Southern Africa often came at the end of a gun barrel. The resistance to entrenched settler rule and colonial power led to armed conflicts that shaped the region's history. Take Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, where the white minority government led by Ian Smith declared independence unilaterally in 1965, refusing Britain's plans for a more measured decolonization. This set off the Rhodesian Bush War, a violent guerrilla conflict where groups like the Zimbabwe African National Union and the Zimbabwe African People's Union fought to bring down the white minority regime. In Namibia, then known as Southwest Africa, Apartheid policies were in full swing. South Africa treated the territory like a buffer zone against communism, leading to the South African border war. This conflict, driven by the Southwest Africa People's Organization, was another long and grueling fight for independence, further complicated by Cold War dynamics. The struggles in Angola and Mozambique were just as intense. Both countries were under Portuguese rule, and both faced powerful resistance from liberation movements. The wars in these countries tied into global Cold War politics, with the Soviet Union and its allies supporting groups like the MPLA in Angola and Frelimo in Mozambique. The Cold War made everything even messier. Western powers like the United States and the United Kingdom were deeply worried about communism spreading in Southern Africa, which affected their support for colonial regimes and settler governments. This support could come in the form of economic aid, 
military assistance, or just diplomatic backing. On the flip side, the Soviet Union and China were busy supporting liberation movements that leaned towards socialism or communism, creating proxy conflicts that complicated the whole process. South Africa's apartheid regime wasn't just content with controlling its own territory. It also interfered in neighboring countries. It intervened in Angola, supporting UNIDA, and in Namibia, where it fought against SWAPO's independence efforts. These interventions were part of the apartheid regime's strategy to maintain regional dominance and counteract communist influences. Adding to the complexity, Southern Africa's vast mineral resources, like diamonds, gold, and uranium, made it a magnet for external interests. The strategic and economic value of the region kept it in the geopolitical spotlight, further complicating the decolonization process. The path to independence in Southern Africa was anything but straightforward, marked by intense conflicts, political upheavals, and international pressure. Yet, despite the chaos, there were key turning points that shifted the momentum toward freedom and eventually led to the end of colonial rule in the region. One of the most significant moments in Southern Africa's journey to independence was the Carnation Revolution in Portugal in 1974. This was a bloodless coup by Portuguese military officers that ended the Estado Novo regime, which had been holding on tightly to its African colonies. With the old regime overthrown, Portugal's new government was much more open to the idea of decolonization. The revolution's emphasis on democracy and freedom influenced Portugal's approach to its colonies in Angola and Mozambique. The change in Portugal's policies paved the way for these countries to become independent in 1975. Another key factor in the push for independence in Southern Africa was the growing international pressure against colonialism and apartheid. The United Nations played a major role, with resolutions condemning apartheid and calling for sanctions against South Africa. These sanctions impacted trade, arms sales, and even cultural and sporting events, isolating the apartheid regime from the international community. Diplomatic efforts and negotiations further added to the pressure. International mediators often stepped in to facilitate talks between conflicting parties, opening doors to dialogue and peaceful transitions. This combined international pressure, along with the internal resistance and armed struggles, eventually created the perfect storm that led to change in Southern Africa. Political and economic instability also became part of the post-independence landscape. Despite these difficulties, the countries of Southern Africa have shown remarkable resilience. They continue to work toward creating more inclusive societies, addressing historical injustices, and finding ways to foster economic growth.